All right, so what we're going to do is a short overview here of how bacteria are classified uh, into groups, and then later we'll go into some of those groups themselves. Um, and what we're going to look at first is uh, sort of the classic method uh, of looking at bacteria, and then we're going to look at some, uh, not all, but some of the modern uh, techniques of looking at the genome of bacteria in order to classify them. So the first thing is looking at some of the, the classic methods, and in addition, modern analysis as well uh, is going to use cell wall. So for example, we might take gram-positive bacteria as an example, okay, uh, versus gram-negative bacteria. And then there's the bacteria that kind of a slightly different uh, type of cell wall, so they might be different, but we're looking at kind of the, the broader strokes here. So for gram-positive bacteria, uh, in a classic method, one of the next things we might do is look at morphology. Okay, so after cell wall, we might look at morphology. So we might separate them into groups based on uh, cocci and bacilli. And again, this is just an example. Um, Obviously, there are other shaped uh, bacteria as well, uh, but we're just kind of breaking it down. Then we might look at growth requirements. So uh, we might have for the cocci, aerobic, and the anaerobic, and the same thing for bacilli, aerobic anaerobic and we'll look at some things like um, biochemical uh, biochemical markers uh, and metabolism so we might say you know for example uh, ferment lactose Do not ferment lactose. Etc. You know, so uh, looking at all the variety of different biochemical tests is something that we do in lab uh, with our bacteria. Uh, we're not doing all the uh, genomic stuff. Um, and that's kind of one way, more of a traditional system. Some of those things are still used in general, but what we're going to find is today, while we refer to that system uh, a lot, uh, we are going to actually name bacteria and put bacteria into groups and look at their actual relationships based on more of a genetic type analysis, which is what we're going to get into. So the classic analysis is much more uh, morphological and then biochemical reactions, growth requirements, uh, motility, you know, the morphology could be like flagella or not flagella and types of flagella. We could include arrangements of bacteria and things like that in there. Okay, so those are all the things that would be more of the classic analysis, which we still observe, which we still make note of, um, but uh, now we're kind of starting off with still cell wall, we're often using other techniques. So in a more modern analysis, we're still using cell wall. Okay, so cell wall is still going to be the primary grouping for bacteria right off the bat. Now, after that, what we're going to start to do is uh, DNA sequencing. So sequencing of typically the small subunit ribosomal RNA. So what is that? Remember, you got a large subunit and a small subunit for a ribosome. And we're looking at the sequence for this, the codes and the DNA for this small subunit, okay? And that, that would be compared between different bacteria. So for example here, let's say we have um, one, two, three, four different bacteria here. <clears throat> 
And these are just 15 locations. 15, uh, five, six, eight, nine, ten, nine, ten, nine, ten, 15. 15 uh, nucleotides in a particular sequence. And we look at a little bit bigger sequence. So why? Why the small subunit um, ribosomal RNA? Partly because of its length. It's not too long, it's not too short. Um, partly because it's, it's evolutionarily conserved. We find it in all different organisms. Also because its rate of mutation is low, uh, so we don't see uh, rapid change over time, but there is some change over time, so it's something that's good to use as a basis for relationships. Um, some of the modern analysis has also shown that really the, the large subunit actually gives us a little bit better picture of the relationships, but because of the size, um, it's a little more lengthy and time consuming and expensive to do, so people stick with the small subunit. Okay, so uh, there's other trade offs of choosing other genes um, for doing the analysis, but uh, typically we're using this one. How is the analysis done? Well, extract the DNA from the organism, amplify the DNA, and then sequence the DNA, and then we compare the sequences. So if we had these organisms here, what we would be doing is, say, comparing then this sequence for differences. You know, say, one with three, and then we'd also compare one, sorry, one with two, one with three, one with four, you know, and we'd compare those to see the differences. We'd look at um, two versus three, two versus four, you know, and then three versus four. We'd look at like the differences between each of the groups, uh, and then we would start to pull out uh, the different types of, you know, relationships, you know, so organisms one and two, maybe three and four, you know, based on the, the differences they have from one another. Uh, and then we start to draw a cladogram. So what is that? So that's kind of like this here. So in the cladogram structure, we have to have some sort of common shared trait at the base. So we have to know sequences that they share, and there has to be a certain amount of that starts in. And then what we have are nodes that are sort of uh, a decision point. And at that particular node is where you may have a certain level of similarity, certain sequences that are similar. There are a variety of different ways to do the cladograms. So what I'm doing here is a cladogram. Uh, and we would use those nodes as sort of a yes-no decision point. And so organisms with, say, a particular trait continue along this, and then those organisms without would break down into another uh, side branch. And then as you, depending on how many organisms uh, or groups of organisms you're classifying, uh, you might need to introduce uh, additional nodes. So you might have keep going along here, then you have an additional node, you know, here, then maybe an additional node, you know, here. And so then you could might might break down your organisms here, like that. You know, so you're they kind of show you the relationships, who's more more closely related, who's more distantly related, uh, those sorts of things. And so each of these different branching points right there would all be the nodes that would separate one group from another group. And so that can be done based on DNA sequencing specifically. But we can use the, this type of analysis to, to even do all the traditional ones. So, you know, say uh, ferment lactose or not, so they can separate them or, or shape, you know, coxy versus not cox versus bacilli, and they can be separated. So you can get different branches and you could get a whole variety of different types of cladograms depending on what um, characteristics you want to put into these nodes in order to um, perform your analysis. What's typically done is a cladogram is created using a certain type of analysis. So just say the molecular analysis, or maybe just a biochemical analysis, or maybe just a morphological analysis, not usually a combination of all. So one cladogram using one particular kind of generic um, area of traits or characteristics. Uh, and then afterward, that's all for the same organisms. And you might end up with different cladograms showing somewhat similar and slightly different relationships. In the end, you can take multiple cladograms and then start to develop uh, what would be called a phylogenetic tree.
So phylogenetic trees will include you know, multiple types of analysis. Multiple different analyses all kind of overlap together. Uh, a phylogenetic tree will also account for something these typically don't, uh, and that's um, evolutionary time. So we can, if we really want to look at ancestral relationships uh, of organisms, then we would take this type of analysis, which is a little more focused type of analysis, combine it with other types of analysis that are equally as focused, but are focusing on different traits, and then we merge them all together into a very a related but different type of analysis called a phylogenetic tree. And that shows us then really a um, bigger picture of the relationships, also shows us the relationships over time, all right? So right now what we have here is sort of the, some of the ways that bacteria are classified based on classical analysis and, and one of the modern analyses using um, comparison of DNA sequences. So, and you can see here, I didn't really point it out, but you know, you're just comparing nucleotides and saying you know, whether they're similar or different. And so you can see oh, there's some of them here that don't change between the groups. Some of them here that are, um, that do change between the groups, but then they're similar between say these two and eventually you're doing calculations with percent uh, the similarity the frequency of similarity sort of between them or, or differences depending on how you want to focus on it um, and then you're gonna do some calculations and then you're gonna start to build your cladogram based on those All right, so that's how that's done well what I'm also going to do is look at uh, other ways uh, in which bacteria are classified using um, DNA hybridization and a GC ratio um, but we're kind of out of space so we're gonna um, hold on